Hey guys, welcome. Uh, let's give it a couple minutes. Uh, let, a, let a few more people on. Uh, we had over 80 registrants, and uh, we only got about uh, 20 so far. So let's give it a couple minutes. Um, just quickly, we will have uh, a couple of polls uh, towards the end of the webinar. If you answer those, um, it will uh, it will remove them from the screen, so you can see the rest of the presentation. Uh, those are helpful to us, and they help us better serve you. Uh, there's only three of them, so if you answer those, that'd be great. Uh, you can answer or you can ask questions on the right-hand side. Uh, just ask it; it won't interrupt me. Um, those would just queue up, and then I can answer those at the end uh, towards that Q&A section. Uh, the more questions, the better. It shows me that these are worth doing, that uh, you guys are interested, and uh, help us make these better, uh, these PowerPoints better, and get you the answers that you guys need. So a couple more minutes here, and we'll we'll get her going. <clears throat> All right, so more people are rolling in here. Uh, if, if you didn't get a chance to see our previous webinars, uh, we had three previously that covered everything from uh, remote networks for public safety, um, solar-powered applications, and uh, those would be uh, available to you if, if they're not already. Uh, we do need to re-record the, the solar the solar solar PowerPoint uh, that uh, we didn't press start on the record, so that should be available, and all of these will be available to you uh, at, at the end of this webinar. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get it going. Uh, this is the fourth and last webinar in this month's series um, of the Hotspot Bootcamp. Uh, today we'll be covering designing wireless IP networks for fixed and mobile video surveillance. Uh, we again we'll have copies of these uh, this today's presentation and the future presentations or the uh, past presentations, uh, a slide set as well. Um, so if you want those, just shoot me an email at mike at hotspot.net. Uh, today the goal is to touch on key points and to get you guys to come back and ask us questions. There's, It's pretty impossible to cover absolutely everything today, so we're going to throw a ton of information at you. It will be fast paced. Uh, don't worry if you miss anything. Again. Um, uh, you'll have the the recorded version and the PDF version uh, for your review at your leisure. Um, let's get it going. We don't have a lot of time. All right, so we're going to start off with a crash course in wireless fundamentals. Uh, this will give us or give you a good base knowledge to work from when moving forward. Uh, there are five main elements of wireless networks that we work with and manipulate to create robust wireless networks. Uh, whether they be mobile or static for IP video. Uh, these include line of sight, the Fresnel zone, wireless frequencies, network topologies, and network capacity. For line of sight, there are three distinct, distinct levels. Uh, line of sight means we have visual line of sight from antenna to antenna, and we have RF line of sight, or the Fresnel zone is clear of obstructions, and we'll just discuss Fresnel zone in the future slide. Near line of sight means our visual line of sight is clear, however we have some obstruction in that RF or the Fresnel zone. Non line of sight means both our visual and RF line of sights are completely obstructed. So to determine your line of sight, we first begin by establishing our visual line of sight. 
That is, the, uh, you see in this image, uh, there's no obstructions in our visual line of sight from antenna to antenna. Next, we determine if we have RF line of sight. And RF line of sight is determined by calculating the Fresnel zone using our wireless link calculator that we'll show you. And this Fresnel zone is uh, pictured as this invisible football or ellipsoidal shaped area extending from antenna to antenna. The idea, the goal here is to keep 60% of this first Fresnel zone clear of obstructions. Uh, if there are obstructions in the Fresnel zone, radio signals can be absorbed or they can bounce off the obstruction and potentially slowing down the radio wave enough so that it, it may reach the receiving antenna out of phase, uh, in effect reducing the signal strength of that wireless link. And that, of course, is going to be a bad thing. Uh, the Fresnel zone is calculated based on the distance of the link and the frequency being used. Uh, for example, using a 5 gigahertz band at a distance of one mile, both the base station and remote station antennas will need to be installed at a sufficient height that gives you roughly nine feet of clearance from any obstruction in the Fresnel zone. So here is our wireless link calculator, and as you can see at a distance of one mile uh, at that five gigahertz band, uh, lower, located in the lower right hand corner, you're seeing that we need to clear about nine feet uh, for, uh, for the Fresnel zone. Um, you would also need to add that 0.66 feet or about a foot uh, to account for the curvature of the earth. So add those together, roughly 10 feet for a mile link and 5 gig, and that will give you your Fresnel line of sight. So to recap a little bit here, here is our visual line of sight, right? where we got we our complete line of sight. We have visual line of sight, and our Fresnel zone is clear. Here is a near line of sight, meaning our visual line of sight is clear. However, we have obstructions encroaching in on that Fresnel zone. And then, uh, of course, we have non-line of sight, meaning both our visual line of sight and our Fresnel zone is obstructed. So what does that mean in regards to, to frequency selection? So once we have the level of line of sight determined, we can then choose the best frequency to fit the scenario. Uh, we always want to start with a 5 gigahertz frequency because it has more frequency channels to choose from, uh, which is going to give us a lot of bandwidth to work with, and room to move away from channels that might already be used in that location. If the link has only near line of sight, and depending on the distance and the material of the obstruction, we would utilize either 5 gigahertz and burn through the obstruction uh, with high gain antennas or drop down to a 2.4 gigahertz. 2.4 gigahertz gives us better penetration through obstructions such as buildings, vegetation, and uh, it is affected less by obstructions in the Fresnel zone. However, it is heavily used by Wi-Fi internet hotspots and is generally not a good choice in urban or highly populated areas. Um, if we do have a non-line of sight scenario, we would either utilize 2.4 gigahertz or drop down to 900 megahertz, depending on what the obstructions are and the distance of the leak. Uh, again, 2.4 gigahertz and 900 megahertz are commonly used frequencies, so they're not always the best option. 900 megahertz is also not very scalable, as there are only a few wireless channels in that band. Um, so really, if we do run into these non-line of sight or near line of sight, uh, uh, problems, the best option is to overcome those obstructions utilizing what we call repeated topology. Um, and we'll get through the, uh, we'll, we'll get to explain those in the future slides. All right, now talking about distances by frequency, you know, how far can we shoot with what, what frequency? With line of sight, we are able to shoot distances of up to 20 miles using high gain, highly directional antennas uh, in both the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands. Uh, with near line of sight, we can shoot up to 10 miles with 900 megahertz using the same high gain, high directional antennas, or up to 2 miles with 2.4 gigahertz. Again, we're using very directional antennas in a point-to-point -point link here. Uh, for non-line of sight scenarios, we can go up to 5 miles with 900 megahertz or about 1,000 feet with 2.4 gigahertz. 
And here's to generalize, uh, these images generalize the performance of frequencies uh, a little bit better graphically. Uh, on the left here, we are showing the penetration power of, of each frequency. So frequencies below one gigahertz can traverse over hills and large land masses and even penetrate trees and buildings. Whereas when you get up to into six gigahertz, uh, that signal is going to be more readily absorbed by obstructions and uh, has trouble penetrating foliage uh, and obstructions at at longer distances. Um, now you can penetrate. Uh, I mean, those those upper end frequencies do have the ability to penetrate obstructions. However, it's going to be at much shorter distances, and you need to use higher gain antennas. Uh, you can see that uh, in the bottom left, those icons of our hot router, and then a uh, a generalized USB cellular modem. Um, our routers have the ability to do frequencies anywhere from 200 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz and cellular technologies are anywhere from 700 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz so just keep that in mind as we're moving along here. Uh, the maximum potential distance of wireless links also decreases as you move into the higher frequencies as shown on the right graph there. Uh, these variables are managed, of course, by the transmission power of the radio and the antennas that we select. So these are just some generalizations to give you a frame of reference. So an important factor to the design of any wireless network is the antenna. So here we can see the radiation pattern of the main types of antennas we will utilize. Uh, this, this image is of an omni antenna. Uh, these will typically be a 360 degree horizontal beam width and uh, with a relatively narrow vertical beam width. And the beam width is really the area in which the antenna has its highest amount of gain and receiving and transmitting. So anything uh, uh, outside of this beam width is going to be attenuated or, or the signal is going to be reduced or, or completely nulled. Um, so uh, the sector antenna are very similar to the omni antenna, but that you're going to reduce the horizontal beam width to a sector of either 90 or 120 degrees instead of that full 360 degrees. Uh, and for that, you're going to get an increase in gain, and you're going to reduce uh, the potential for wireless interference uh, uh, around your, your degrees that, it, that it's not pointing to. The parabolic and panel antennas will be much more directional with their beam widths. Uh, and, and they have a vertical and horizontal beam width anywhere between 4 to 30 degrees. Uh, generally, again, the lower the beam width, the higher the gain of the antenna. Okay, moving on to wireless topologies. Okay, a point-to-point -to -point topologies uh, are the most simple and most common wireless architectures. Uh, you essentially have one wireless transmitter and one wireless receiver. Uh, they are really transceivers, you know, each of these uh, are transceivers, but for simplicity's sake, we'll just use transmitter receiver terminology. For point-to-point -point links, you utilize directional antennas again, so though you think about your parabolic and panels. If we have long distances to traverse, uh, you're typically going to deploy a point-to-point -point topology. Uh, note, you can transmit multiple cameras uh, in point-to-point -to -point topologies just by utilizing a switch. So have your switch, plug in your cameras, plug in the transmitter, and it will transmit all those cameras that are in the switch over the wireless link to the receiver. A point-to-multi-point -point topology has a single base station wireless node receiving multiple remote transmitters. This is similar to a star topology in a wired network. Um, a point-to-multi-point -point topology will typically use either a sector or an omni antenna at the receiving base station, while the remote transmitters are using, using uh, the more directional panel or parabolic antennas, of course, depending on the distance. All right, for a repeated topology, um, these are used to chain link wireless nodes together, either to traverse long distances or to navigate around obstructions, as we discussed earlier. That's a very commonly used tactic. Um, you know, get used to, to a repeated type of topology. It's going to help us be able to connect to cameras way out on the edge uh, that don't have line of sight back to the head end or to the base station receivers. 
And lastly, in a uh, mesh topology. So in a mesh topology, every wireless node has the ability to, to communicate with every other wireless node within that mesh cell that it's in range of. Uh, this, top, this topology is used when there are multiple destinations for data to flow to or in urban environments for mobile applications. So some wireless be best practices here. Uh, network capacity. Uh, e you know, each of these topologies can support uh, various amounts of bandwidths and um, uh, camera loads. Uh, for a point-to-point -point link, you can connect up to 13 cameras, and that's independent, really, of the resolution and frame rate. Um, we'll get to the other cutoff point, which would be our bandwidth. So there's essentially two cutoff points to determine the capacity of a network. Uh, the total amount of cameras, and that has to do with uh, a packets per second basis, and then our throughput, which is your, you know, your megabits per second. Uh, so for, for camera load, point to point, again, 13 cameras. In a point to multipoint, you're looking up to 12 cameras. In the repeated topology, up to eight cameras uh, maximum aggregated to the last repeater. Um, and, and we'll show you in future slides, that's what I'm talking about. But eight cameras to the last repeater and then 12 to the base station. Uh, there's a graphic that, that will explain this in the future set. On a mesh topology, uh, it's going to be reduced to eight cameras in a mesh topology, and we'll explain why. Uh, a side note here, every camera and VMS combination, they, they, they have varying levels of latency and tolerance and bandwidth requirements. So the values that we see here are, are not set in stone. They're really a good rule of thumb. Uh, that we've developed through the years and working with the various VMS and camera manufacturers. So, for example, you know, you may be able to get away with 20 cameras and a point-to-point -point or a point-to-multi-point link. However, you know, it's a good rule of thumb to, to design in some buffer into these wireless networks. Okay, the other aspect of network capacity, as we said, we're talking about throughput here. Okay, so in a point-to-point -point topology, you're looking at a maximum of 220 megabits per second and, uh, for point-to-point -point and same thing for point-to-multipoint topologies. Maybe a little less in point-to-multipoint as there's uh, some, some timing variation there. Um, in a mesh to or in a repeated topology, uh, you're going to get 220 megabits per second for the first hop and then reduced by about 30% for each additional hop. So if you're going from end to end, you're cutting about 30% for those additional hops beyond the first. Okay. For uh, mesh topologies, you have about 60 megabits per second if it was a uh, just node to node um, of available throughput. But that is going to be reduced by 50% for every additional wireless hop that the data has to traverse. Okay, to get from you know the edge camera uh, back to a head end. So if you reach these maximum amounts of cameras and throughput for these topologies, um, you're not stuck. You just need to add another base station to add more capacity. Pretty simple. So you can have projects with you know 100 plus cameras in the same uh, small geographic area. We just need to add more wireless base stations or mesh nodes uh, to to allow for that capacity. Okay, to describe why mesh was, is going to have a reduced throughput, um, we'll describe the technology behind it. So uh, mesh enables, uh, again, it enables each wireless node in the, ne in the network to communicate with every other wireless node uh, that it's in range of. And, and this is good for certain applications. However, with mesh, with mesh uh, data travels through the wireless network indeterministically meaning that that data has multiple paths it can take from the source, from the data source, right, to its destination. Uh, and these paths can change based on route scoring, uh, the, availabil the availability of wireless nodes, uh, the physical positions of those nodes themselves, and congestion on the network. Uh, so this tends to lead to latency and network jitter as that data hops around from you know, mesh node to mesh node. And the data can even arrive out of order, requiring that receiving device that, or that end device to reorganize those packets, reorder them, uh, so that they're going to display the video properly. 
and that again adds to the latency and hence reduced in throup uh, throughput. Uh, as a result, again, maximum co carrying capacity of each wireless mesh, ce mesh cell is reduced. Um, now, a mesh cell is essentially a group of mesh nodes on a single wireless channel sharing the same SSID. Um, now, we can have, of course, multiple mesh cells within a project area to compensate for the reduced capacity. You know, so if, if we need 16 cameras and we needed a mesh topology, well, we'd have two mesh cells handling handling that, that capacity. So moving to a point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint uh, or even a repeated architecture uh, allows us to enable our uh, TDMA-like protocol for, for wireless communications. Essentially what this is, is it, it's a proprietary hotspot protocol that allows the base station to coordinate with the remote stations and the base station essentially tells those remote stations when and how much to transmit. So this in turn greatly reduces wireless collisions, uh, it provides a more deterministic path for data to travel, and that's going to reduce your latency and allow us to transmit you know, your, your multi-megapixel, your, your ones, threes, fives, tens, twenties, even forty megapixel cameras in point-to-point -point and point-to-multi-point -point topologies, and even repeated topologies. So what is, our, what is the best frequency to use for static applications? For static, uh, you know, that, that really depends on a few dependencies, uh, such as the presence of obstructions uh, or other wireless networks, uh, whether we have line of sight or not, how much bandwidth is required for the amount of data that we're, uh, that's going over the network or the amount of cameras that we have, and what's available to us through the local regulatory bodies. Uh, but a great majority of our static wireless applications are utilizing 5.8 gigahertz. Um, it, it, the reason for that is that 5.8 gigahertz has the greatest amount of bandwidth. Uh, it's an unlicensed band. Uh, it has plenty of wireless channels to choose from. So again, it's easy to stay away from you know, potential interference from other wireless devices. What about, what's the best frequency to use for mobile applications? Well, we have the same dependencies as we did for the static applications, however, we can utilize multiple wireless technologies and frequencies which greatly increases the ability for mobile assets to stay connected on the move. Uh, the typical configuration for mobile applications is to still use 5.8 gigahertz which will connect uh, for, for the backhaul, which will connect our static, uh, the mobile units to these static hotspots. Uh, we, we will discuss these uh, hotspots in future slides. So when the mobile asset roams out of these hotspot areas, our router can automatically switch over to the next available wireless technology. Let's say it's a 2.4 gigahertz, 900, or even cellular technologies. And typically at a last resort, if uh, the, the router is going to switch over to a cellular connection uh, when roaming out of those hotspots. Okay, a little bit about data, uh, data transport protocols. Um, TCP or transmission control protocol is a uh, connection oriented protocol, meaning it keeps track of the state of the connection. For example, is it up, is it closed, is it down? Uh, this statefulness does come at a price of bandwidth as TCP is going to have a lot more information, a lot more headers in its packets, uh, which tends to eat up bandwidth. Uh, UDP, or user, data pro, uh, user datagram protocol, on the other hand, is a connection list protocol, meaning it doesn't check to see if you receive the information or not. It, it's just going to send the data in the hopes that it reached its target destination. Uh, this greatly reduces the amount of header information and thus it's going to open up more bandwidth. And can, <clears throat> it also reduces latency as each packet sent using UDP doesn't require the sender to receive an acknowledgement from the receiver before it can send more data. Right? So it's not, it's not an acknowledged protocol. That makes UDP uh, the best transmission pr protocol for latency sensitive applications such as voice and of course IP video. So the takeaway here is if given the choice Choose a camera VMS combination that's going to stream using UDP 
Uh, preferably, you're going to do uh, RTP over UDP, or, or that's real-time transport, real transport protocol over a user datagram protocol. Okay, moving from the protocols to the larger data types, um, if we have a project that will utilize multiple data types, such as access control data from card readers, uh, supervisory control and data acquisition, or, or SCADA data from industrial components, or Wi-Fi for general public internet access, you'll want to, to, uh, you'll want to, to, to combine those latency tolerant applications correctly with your latency sensitive data types. Our latency sensitive data types, of course, being VoIP or voice over IP and IP video. So for example, with proper planning, uh, it is okay to have latency tolerant applications on the same network as the latency sensitive applications, since you could just QoS or uh, quality of service and prioritize the traffic. Um, however, it's not a good pra practice to combine multiple latency sensitive applications on the same wireless network. So in general, keep your VoIP and video networks separate from each other, but it is okay to pair one of those latency sensitive uh, applications with those latency tolerant applications and just QoS to prioritize the latency sensitive traffic. All right, lastly for best practices, uh, there are some unique considerations that each installation environment tends to offer. Uh, for rural sites, you're typically looking at longer distances to traverse, uh, so tall antenna heights and use of high gain antennas are common. Uh, vegetation is either repeated around or burned through with high gain antennas. Um, residential environments tend to have the same, a, a lot of vegetation obstructions. And street paths are often curvy, so if we're utilizing light poles to mount our transmitters to, um, it, it's gonna, you're going to have to use a lot more repeaters to, uh, to follow uh, street paths to end up to our head end destination. There's also lots of Wi-Fi to contend with, uh, so 2.4 gigahertz tends to be out of the question in residential areas. In city installations, uh, you've got very tall buildings, and these act as complete line of sight obstructions. Buildings also act as wireless reflectors, so you'll get some really interesting and unpredictable wireless propagation behavior. Uh, for example, you can get connectivity in locations you would not expect to get. Uh, as this wireless signal is bouncing from building to building, uh, which can be a good thing, uh, and it does sometimes extend our, our hotspot uh, locations. In uh, in industrial um, industrial sites, they often are chaotic uh, um, street layouts. So again, we're going to have to use a lot of repeaters to to navigate through obstructions. Uh, there's often high levels of electromagnetic interference, which uh, will wreak havoc on wireless networks. It, it actually physically degrades wireless signals, and it can even induce electric currents on electronics, which could eventually damage them. Uh, one more note on, on city applications is you, you're tending to install these on light poles or uh, traffic lights. Um, it's a good idea to use power conditioning UPSs. Uh, in these applications as we find that city power uh, tends to be all over the place. So condition your power in, in, a, in a lot of these applications, really, um, that's a good, good path to choose. So let's get into the actual design of these wireless networks. And we'll start with static applications. All right, some terminology moving forward. Uh, the head end right, is where the NVR, or the network video uh, recording, uh, software and hardware is going to be placed. Um, a wireless client is typically an end wireless node in point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint topologies, uh, or it could even be a, a mesh node in a, in a wireless mesh topology. A wireless repeater is a dual radio unit, uh, and those are the units that are going to allow us to um, repeat around obstructions and also create uh, the, the Wi-Fi hotspots with the backhaul to the head end that we'll be discussing. Um, and last, a wireless base station is the final wireless receiver node, typically located at the head end. So for fixed IP video applications, we'll go through each wireless topology we discussed earlier, right? the point-to-point, 
point to multipoint repeated and mesh topologies. Uh, the first slide of each topology is going to show a bird's eye view to get you, uh, give you a kind of a diagrammatical layout. Um, and then we'll show an isometric view to get you kind of 3D thinking and uh, some more detailed information. So here we have a point to point link, very straightforward again, simple as can be. You have a head end, we got a wireless base station um, connected under switch and you know network to that NVR, and we got a wireless link going out to our remote client out there with a camera. Could be multiple cameras again. Um, here, here's the isometric view we discussed. Um, we're utilizing rooftops of buildings typically uh, to achieve those lines of sight and make sure that Fresnel zone is clear of obstructions. Uh, you could also, uh, you know, you, we can also use the light poles or really anything that's going to give us the height to clear those those uh, lines of sight in Fresnel zones. So with this basic point-to-point -to -point topology, again, you're able to transmit up to 13 cameras or 220 megabits per second worth of d data, whichever comes first. You know, again, if we uh, break that capacity or go over that capacity. We just need to simply add another base station, which is going to give us another 220 megabits per second or 13 cameras worth of uh, wireless capacity. Uh, side note here, point-to-point -point links are the only types of wireless topologies that can be full duplex. Right? Uh, we create a full duplex link by utilizing our dual radio units or those repeater units. Um, Full duplex is great if you're transmitting multiple data types that we discussed earlier. If you're going to combine, you know, VoIP and video and SCADA and access control, and you got a lot of it, um, we would recommend doing a, a full duplex link. Um, and if your if your data is bilateral, bidirectional. Okay, moving on to uh, uh, point to multipoint. So. In point-to-multipoint -point topologies, if the lines of sight are available, you can employ uh, this point-to-multipoint -point topology. Again, each remote station can have multiple cameras attached to it, utilizing a switch. So here we've got remote, four remote clients, all talking back to a single base station. Uh, you could have really any combination of camera and transmitter. Uh, you could have 13 transmitters, each with a single camera. Or one, you know, two transmitters with you know seven cameras or seven and six cameras, etc. So a point-to-multipoint -point topology is efficient as it's going to save you money by reducing the number of base station receivers. And again, we have around 220 megabits per second or 12 cameras capacity in this topology. Uh, before you need to add more network capacity by adding an additional base station. <clears throat> so. If we can't get lines of sight from remote stations and cameras to the central head end, then you're moving into your repeated topology. So this works especially well in, in urban environments uh, as it allows us to weave through the city, uh, the city utilizing available lines of sight, you know, hopping uh, point to point uh, from, from pole to pole or from building to building until we eventually reach the head end. And uh, a, a good tactic here is to place repeaters at opposite sides of the streets so that you shoot caddy corner versus parallel to the street. Uh, that helps to avoid uh, you know, line of sight and Fresnel zone issues uh, as you avoid the obstructions such as trees and light poles at, if you're going directly horizontal to the, to the, to the street. All right, so in this scenario, in this repeated scenario, we have five wireless hops uh, using four repeaters in the middle. Uh, this is generally the maximum amount of hops you will want to design in for any one wireless backhaul, as using repeaters does reduce the end-to-end -end throughput and camera capacity to each repeater. Again, that uh, you will want to have no more than eight cameras accumulated to the last repeater uh, before you reach the base station, as shown here. So you can see that we have two, four, six, eight wirelessly go into our last repeater here. Uh, that's the maximum that we'd want to do, but we can have these additional four cameras uh, for a total of 12 to the, to the head end base station. Uh, a good configuration technique for uh, repeated topologies is to narrow band at the edge or to reduce wireless channel width 
at the far ends of the links of the backhaul and then gradually increase those bandwidths to match the required amount of data as you start going towards the head end, right? So we might do a 5 megahertz wide channel on this link, then open that up into a 10 megahertz wide channel for this leg, uh, and open it to a 20, and then finally to a 2040 or MIMO link here. Uh, that does a few things. Uh, that It reduces the potential for interference, uh, increases the amount of available wireless channels for, for scalability, and creates highly stable links by utilizing less complex modulation schemes. All right. Uh, moving on to mesh, you can utilize mesh topologies if you have a reduced number of cameras to transmit um, or if we need a wireless architecture that will adapt to route or line of sight changes on the fly. So it, mesh topology, this mesh topology does add some latency to the system, but if you keep the camera counts around 8 per mesh cell, you shouldn't run into any major issues. Uh, you can add lots of mesh cells per site to increase network capacity, of course, but just know that one of those mesh nodes for each mesh cell needs to be located at the head end so that that data has a hopping off point to get to the NVR. Uh, these mesh links do provide some redundancy features, but they have their limitations. Uh, for example, you have to utilize omnidirectional or sectorized antennas to achieve that radiation pattern that's going to allow them to connect to multiple units simultaneously. And, and that will effectively reduce the, the maximum distance of these wireless links. Again, getting back to our antenna theory, uh, you know, the greater the horizontal beam width, the, the less the gain of the antenna is going to be. So here's the isometric view for a mesh network again. Uh, you're looking at around 60 megabits per second maximum throughput, uh, but end-to-end -end throughput will be reduced if the data is taking uh, multiple hops. And again, it's about 40 to 50 percent reduction in throughput from uh, each consecutive node-to-node -node hop. Um, there are some really cool, neat auto-healing features, uh, but we don't see them utilized too frequently in uh, static deployments, and it may not, you know, a mesh architecture may not be warranted. Uh, due to these reductions in network capacity and the introduction of, of latency into the system. So uh, typically we're looking at you know, our point-to-point, point-to-multipoint and uh, repeated topologies versus a mesh in static applications. So lastly for fixed video IP uh, installation designs, uh, but we can use uh, a hybrid of these technologies or, or these topologies uh, and create some really robust networks to solve a wide range of site constraints. So we still need to stick to each individual topology's general rule of thumb, but you can see that a huge number of unique designs can be created to solve a lot of the site constraints that we're faced with. And again, if we reach the network capacity of a base station, we simply add another base station, add more cameras, add more capacity. So on top of the physical network connections, uh, including the, the wireless and hardwired links, you can, of course, uh, work the network, so to speak, by utilizing the full feature sets of hotspot routers. All right? You can route to reduce broadcast domains and isolate networks. We can VLAN to isolate specific ports and cameras, uh, set quality of service rules to shape network traffic, and we can, uh, to prioritize you know, video or, or PTZ data, for example, on multi-data type networks. Uh, you can even create and connect to VPNs, creating these encrypted tunnels through existing network infrastructure. So keep these ideas in mind when you're thinking about the constraints and opportunities a new project may have to offer. Uh, moving on to the mobile side. Uh, when designing wireless networks for mobile applications, we can use the same wireless topologies we just discussed in static video applications, but now we have the addition of a new technique called a hotspot. Uh, these hotspots are similar to a hotspot you find in a Starbucks to connect to the internet. Uh, and essentially, we use omnidirectional or sectorized antennas to broadcast and receive wireless over large swaths of areas, which allows these roaming vehicles to get network connectivity uh, when they utilize our uh, hot mobile or hot mesh products. Uh, this topology typically uses dual radio units, 
So the the one that one radio, the repeater, um, has two two radios in it. One of the radios is creating the wireless hotspot that's used for for that access, the the remote mobile access. While the other radio is used to create the backhaul to a head end, right? So we keep that network connectivity. Uh, here we can see that we've got two large hotspots giving uh, giving mobile clients wireless network access with a point to multi point topology for the backhaul to the head end. And we can create all sorts of hotspot configurations uh, utilizing the various antennas in the previous slides. Um, so uh, radiation, you know, using the different radiation patterns of maybe a more high gain antenna, uh, we can shoot down or up and down these corridors and have a hotspot for specific streets uh, using directional antennas. And this image kind of gives you an explanation of that, and it shows you what kind of throughput you could expect and how much distance we can actually get by shooting a hotspot down a street. Um, so here, again, using high, high gain panel antennas to shoot down a boulevard, for example, um, where we have a mobile vehicle using a hot mobile wireless client device um, uh, with, with one of our mobile omni antennas installed. Uh, you can see that you can get a car connected up to about two miles with line of sight and achieve around four megabits per second. Um, and four megabits per second is going to be plenty for our live live viewing and downloading of video utilizing our mobile VMS platforms that we'll discuss. And again, we can cover large areas with wireless hotspots by stringing along units just as we did for the fixed video applications. So we can use a combination of those topologies uh, uh, to get the areas of coverage that we need to give to our, to our customers. Another interesting option that you may not have thought of is, uh, that will greatly extend the coverage area of our wireless hotspot is to utilize existing network drop-ins that may be available in, in, the, net, in the city. Uh, these could be fiber, could be copper drop-ins, and even existing wireless infrastructure. Um, they at least need to have some type of network route or connectivity back to the head end and VR that we are trying to connect to, to either push video to or pull video from. Uh, and this is a great way of increasing our hotspot uh, footprint or coverage while reducing the cost of the wireless infrastructure. So, uh, so far, you know, we have seen how we can saturate areas with wireless hotspots for mobile connectivity um, in what we call a, a private wireless network. But what happens when a mobile asset roams outside of these designated hotspots? Uh, so we will answer that question moving forward. Keep that in mind. And thus far, we've covered how to create these wireless networks for both mobile and static applications. So let's move to the actual smarts and parts that allows us to push and pull video through these wireless networks that we've already created. Uh, for mobile applications, there are four key components to mobile video. Uh, these are the ability to record locally in the vehicle at full resolution and full frame rate of the cameras, the ability to transmit real-time video from that roaming vehicle to a central monitoring station for viewing and or for the person inside the vehicle to view live video from that central monitoring station. Third, the ability to wirelessly upload the locally recorded video to a central storage server use it, utilizing a high throughput wireless link. Lastly, the ability to upload and download video from cloud servers for viewing real-time or recorded video over the internet. With the exception of record lo the record locally feature, uh, these applications require some form of network connectivity to function. So that's where our wireless hotspots and a cellular connection goes to work. Um, there are also some additional features we can offer in combination with these, such as GPS tracking, vehicle diagnostic information from the car's OBD2 port, and we can even sense when a police cruiser's light bar goes on and off and meta tag the video for easily search and retrieval later. On the hardware side, the most common hotspot networks products that are utilized 
uh, in these mobile applications are the Hotshot Micro MVR 1000 on the left, uh, which is a very small form factor, low power consuming MVR. Uh, in the middle, the Hot Mesh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Hot Mesh Multi Radio Wireless Router, uh, which is utilized for high availability network connectivity. And lastly, on the right, the Hot Mobile Single Radio Client Router. Uh, now each of these, uh, both the hot mesh and the hot mobile wireless routers are typically utilizing our multi-band, multi-polarized omni antenna, which you see there in white. Uh, that would be installed on a trunk lid or the rooftop, for example, of the roaming vehicle via, via the through hole or a magnetic mount uh, option. Here we have a couple slides to, to go into more detail on those products. Uh, we'll move along a little bit uh, because we are a little bit pressed for time. So you can review these at a future date. And let's cover uh, uh, the software side. So on the software side, our MVE and MVE, uh, MVV software packages are the smarts that allows you to have all that great mobile viewing features uh, we just discussed. So MVE gives you the ability to record locally to the micro MVR, view and push video in real time with a feature that we call ART or adaptive rate transcoding. And essentially what that is is uh, MVE is constantly shaping the video to push the best quality possible over dynamic and variable network connections. Um, so you could push video, uh, really good quality video, over as little as 150 kilobits per second of bandwidth. So that gives you an idea, idea of the capabilities of, of MVE. MVE also has cloud-based storage and retrieval and GPS tracking features. So add, that, add to that, MVV brings powerful video management and search features based on meta tagging. It also allows inputs for vehicle diagnostic information, as we discussed with OBD2, and can even sense that police light bar going on and off and meta tag the data for quick retrieval. Here's the interface for MVE. And this is what you would see uh, in, in utilizing the uh, Windows platform client viewer. Uh, it's also a browser-based option, so you can get that right on your phone, view a single camera, view multiple cameras, uh, download recorded video, and of course view that live video as the vehicle, the mobile asset is on the road. Here's the interface for MVV. Uh, you'll notice it looks like a, a, a very typical VMS. Um, again, this is going to provide uh, amazing search options in the meta, tag, uh, meta tagging of video, um, also allowing us for higher retention uh, uh, projects that require maybe a year of storage. We can uh, push, push all this video to LTO tape, um, push it out to the clouds, and uh, um, really this is going to be a very high powerful way to manage all your, your video. We have a couple diagrams here for viewing later. Um, this is going to show you the basic network diagram of how the NVR camera connects up, um, how does it get its network connectivity, and how can I view that video, whether it's a client device or a, you know, a smartphone. Uh, same thing for MVV. This gives you more of the storage backend diagram, and it will show you the different tiers of storage uh, and, and how each of those uh, come into play for MVV's search features. So let's bring this all home. Let's take a mobile asset here, and in this example, it will be a police cruiser. We'll install the Micro MVR 1000 in the vehicle. Uh, that gives us the ability to record on board the cameras locally at full resolution, full frame rate. And you can utilize really any VMS here, um, you know, just for this basic recording, uh, local recording feature. But if you want to get, if you want to get all those neat features we discussed, like doing video from um, a mobile vehicle in real time from any location in the world with an internet connection or uploading video to cloud storage, GPS tracking, etc., you need to install MVE or MVV on that micro MVR. So that's to get that network connectivity. That's where the Hotmobile wireless client comes in. 
uh, it enables that mobile asset to hop onto these hotspot or wireless networks, providing the connectivity for MVE and MVV to do their network-based functions. Uh, this also gives you the ability to upload large amounts of video to the head end when the vehicle is connected to a wireless hotspot. This is something we call the, the video dump truck feature. Um, if you need to have increased availability of a mobile asset beyond uh, our 5.8 gigahertz hotspot and cellular connection, it's recommended to utilize the hot mesh wireless, wire, <clears throat> excuse me, the hot mesh wireless client device in place of the hot mobile. So the, the hot mesh device uses multiple wireless technologies to always remain in network connectivity. Uh, it also allows you to do advanced networking functions such as load balancing, bandwidth aggregation, and even link failover. Finally, adding a cellular modem to any of these products answers the question of how you stay connected when roaming outside of our previously created Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, here's quickly one real-world example. City of Gaithersburg uh, utilized our hot mobile devices uh, to connect up to their existing Panasonic arbitrators that were uh, recording a few uh, analog cameras and we were the uh, wireless high throughput wireless mechanism to do that video dump truck feature that we discussed so we even completely replaced uh, Cisco Cisco access points at the head end and then of course put in our uh, our hot mobiles into 50 police cruisers uh, they could have just as easily put in our micro MVR product um, and had a cellular modem in there to um, have live viewing out on the edge. And um, we'll, we'll now open it up to q and I know I threw a lot at you. So let's see what kind of questions we got here. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to throw some polls at you. And if you don't mind answering those, that'd be great. Okay, so the first question we have here is, is there any kind of best practices for shooting wirelessly across rivers? Yes, so uh, bodies of water are going to do lots of things to, to a wireless, uh, wireless link. Um, it pretty much uh, it will attenuate it, will reflect it, refract it, absorb it. it. It does every possible thing under the sun to a wireless signal. So generally, we take about a 10 to 20% uh, uh, hit on our, uh, our 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 fade our margin of um, our our dB fade essentially, so we're going to want to calculate using our uh, using our wireless link calculator and account for that 10 to 20 percent reduction and use higher gain antennas. So of course, depending on the the uh, distance of that water body or, or the size of the water body and the distance we're shooting over it and the height of our antennas um, is going to tell us what, how much uh, gain we have to throw in the system to compensate for those reduced um, properties that, that water uh, gives to, to wireless. Good question there. Uh, I'm going ahead and close that poll. Um, keep questions coming in. Again, the whole purpose of this is to raise some, you know, interest and get you guys thinking about these projects, um, give you a forum to answer any questions. And right now we answered the one question there, so I'm going to throw another poll at you. If you could answer those, that'd be awesome. Again, ask questions on the right-hand side. Awesome. So far, about 90% of you saying this is useful. 10% of you said kind of. That's great. If it, um, if it didn't answer your questions, now's a great time to ask them. Okay, we're getting some questions coming in. Uh, Jason asks, any backwards compatibility with existing FireTide meshes? Uh, ooh, so no. You're, we're not going to have the compatibility. They're going to be using uh, proprietary uh, uh, wireless protocols. Uh, they have their own mesh protocol. Uh, we have our own, so no. 
Uh, unless they are dropping down to an 802.11 standard, uh, you know, at that point we would be, you know, play play nice and be compatible. Um, next question here: What is the interface called to a police card? You mentioned it. Um, I believe you're referring to. Or let me close that poll, and let's go to um, our slide set here. Uh, and let me bring up my. Okay, is this what you're discussing? The MVE and MVV interfaces, Stephen? If you can elaborate on that. Okay, yes. All right. Uh, so, what is the interface called to a police car? So, in the police cruiser, right? They have the option to have some type of PDA or a laptop device, which will have the ability to uh, to view video that we've stored, you know, or pushed to the cloud, or that's stored in the cloud. You know, as long as we have that network connectivity, again, utilizing the Hotmobile uh, cellular connection, we he can view video when he's on his beat. He's going, he's going out there doing his rounds. You know, um, now if he has a micro and VR in the vehicle, he's recording his his video, and then. If we have network connectivity using cell, using our hot, uh, you know, our hotspots and our hotmobile, then we can push that locally recorded video to a central site for central monitoring. So somebody can be looking at him, making sure he's okay. Or um, let's say a trigger happens, you know, the police cruiser light bar comes on, and that triggers remote central monitoring to start now dialing in and viewing viewing the video of this this mobile asset. Uh, so, so the interface that's there on uh, anybody that's going to be viewing video, you have the the Windows interface, which is the the, the client. It's typically called a you know client interface. Um, so that's downloadable um, and, and and configurable to point to these remote servers, and then you're able to view all those mobile assets that are that have network connectivity and are pushing their video to a central server. And then that central server is disseminating it to any of these remote clients. And then, of course, anybody with a handheld device and a network connect connection can open up a web browser. And then that, that is then their interface to view this video. Great questions. OK, Daniel asks, uh, is this mobile equipment potentially compatible with major VMSs like Milestone? Awesome. Yes. So the micro VR is a, uh, we like to call it a VMS agnostic platform, right? So you could throw on SSI on there, Exact Vision, Milestone, you name it, you can utilize it on the uh, micro MVR. Now that being said, you may not, get, you might not get, or you probably will not get all the great features that we're offering with our mobile VMSs, right? With MVE and MVV, so you're not going to be able to push video. Uh, over as little as 150 kilobits per second on Milestone as you would with our MVE product. Uh, so it, it's really about plugging in each of these, wh whether it's the hardware or the software platforms, plugging it in as needed. So if it's just just local recording that we need to do in vehicle uh, and we don't need any kind of live view um, you know, on the road type of access, then yeah, have the micro MVR, throw on Milestone, and away you go. Um, now, if we want to get rid of that sneaker net type of mentality where I have to pull a hard drive from a mobile asset and then upload it to my central server, that's where putting a wireless base station at the head end and putting the Hotmobile in the vehicle and the mobile asset comes into play. So mobile asset parks, it's within range of that um, hotspot base station. We have a high throughput link. We're now transferring that video that's been recording, you know, your eight, ten hours a day from that mobile asset. Now, each of those VMSs is going to have a different mechanism to do that. They may do it automatically. Um, that's that's a, a bit rare um, these days. That's why we have these these offerings because these are automatic. These are solving a problem that's out there and that nobody has solved. Uh, so, uh, again, it, you. 
we have to look at the feature sets of the VMS to, uh, to be able to do what, what uh, the customer is needing it to do. Great questions. Keep them coming. Um, I think I've got one more poll here. I'll launch it now. If you answer those, that'd be great. All right. Um, again, these will be available to you in the recorded format and the PDF format. Um, it was quick. It was a lot of information. Uh, you know, we want to pique your interest, uh, get you guys asking questions. You know, come to us after the fact. Give me a call. Uh, phone number is 805-541-9477, extension 6003. Again, that's only my emails. Uh, email me at mike at hotspot.net. And uh, uh, we look forward to hearing from you guys. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. And we'll give it about three minutes to have some more questions. We still have some people on. So I'll give you guys three minutes to ask some more questions. All right. Uh, we do have some more PowerPoints coming up or more more webinars. Um, forgot the exact title. Maybe, Charlotte, you can throw in the exact title in that question spot. Um, they will be going into more depth into the uh, mobile VMS platforms, the MVE and MVV platforms. So look out for those. All right, a couple minutes and uh, we'll wrap it up. Okay, new question coming in. How would we get a copy of this presentation? Um, just shoot me an email, mike at hotspot.net. It's in the chat right there. Uh, send me an email. Let me know what you what you guys need. I, I think we'll just have it on a um, on Dropbox, so we'll we'll broadcast that link and you can pick the video or the PDF or both as needed. All right, polls are closed. Uh, looks like everyone's answered their questions or asked their questions. Again, give me a call. Uh, that's what we're here for. And thank you so much for participating. Uh, look out for the future webinars that are going to go into more in-depth on MVV and MVE. And thanks for attending. We'll, we'll talk to you later.